Philanthropy is a growing space in Africa, so people came from all walks of life to unpack it. And now we begin to say these foundations are in aggregate are giving over two billion dollars each and every year. To build this knowledge, we need everybody in this room working together. We've taken the first step at the Lilly Family School. We just released a new brand new index called the Global Philanthropy Environment Index. What we asked the Foundation Center to do for us was to not so much follow the money but to look at the money that was going to what we term Africa headquartered organizations. And the reason why we use that terminology is that we wanted to make a distinction between international NGOs that were based in an Africa country and an African organization that had its headquarters here at the home continent. The move in recent years to shift towards more, our funding towards more educational and systemic interventions has resulted in funding gaps in other areas. I think the language that we use around philanthropy is important. The importance of what we've been practicing within Africa since time immemorial, community to community. Like I grew up in a township where you gave and helped those that needed help within the community. And in our work, our team came up with two types of community philanthropy, what we call horizontal philanthropy and what we call vertical philanthropy. When we start with accountability, this is us, the funder, as the centre of the equation. Yes, it's our money, well, not always ours, but ultimately it's not about our lives and we have to put that at the funding centre. Uh, and effectively, on this side is the big school of business, the big business school. And on the opposite side is the school of governance. Uh, they don't always like each other, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they do uh, increasingly more and more work with each other. Uh, uh, and that's the way it should be. Uh, but effectively, I do want to welcome you. Uh, I don't think uh, that this conference can be more timely. I was just telling colleagues outside that yesterday I was um, reflecting on a report produced by the World Bank on higher education and how to finance higher education in South Africa uh, in the aftermath of these misfortune. And one of the things that this report did was one mechanism we looked at was uh, increasing mobilization of resources from philanthropists uh, on the African continent. And it made the point, of, obviously, 
that Africa has today far more high work, high net worth individuals than at any other point in its, in, its, in its history. And that we need to be able to mobilize the funds of these financiers to uh, begin to assist in the financing of higher education, which would enable the inclusive developmental outcomes we want. And the thing that I reflected on them was my personal experience, if you like, as a bureaucrat in a university. And I will say to them that I've been interacting with many of these high net worth individuals. And actually, it's become incredibly difficult to get them to invest in institutions like higher education. And I was reflecting on it that there were perhaps two reasons that this report has not taken into account. Three perhaps. The first, uh, which is well known in the literature, is the issue of the tax system. The United States tax system is very enabling for philanthropic investments by philanthropists in higher education and in other courses. The South African tax system is not as enabling. And so in a sense, that's a huge impediment and we need to understand. The second I said is that uh, most of the philanthropists, black philanthropists on the continent, are first generation high net worth individuals. And what is interesting is that the pattern of philanthropic investments is very, very different. It doesn't mean they don't invest, but how they invest may be very different to how second or third or fourth generation philanthropists in this. It is not as easy as simply to suggest that because you've got high net worth individuals, therefore you be able to access the resources. You need far more research on the form of that, of that, of those high net worth individuals, how they give, what form they give, why they give, the impetus for their giving, because if you don't understand any of those, you can't rethink how to create the policy frameworks to be able to mobilize the resources from those, from those collectives. The significant amount of giving in poor communities on the African continent. Um, and that mobilizes into millions and billions of rands and dollars. If you can think of that and mobilize that in a clever way and influence the pattern of that giving, to outcomes that enable inclusive development, then you would be doing something fundamentally different. But if you're going to be doing any of this, you need a center. Because research centers need to be part of a global academy, but they need to be contextually grounded. They need to be located within a context, because that context informs social patterns of behavior. And this center is effectively the mechanism, the institutional mechanism to enable that to happen. Not for South Africa alone, but for the continent as well. Uh, and so, uh, again, welcome to Wits University. Uh, I do hope that you have wonderful deliberations. And for those of you who traveled afar, please take a couple of hours, perhaps a couple of days, and sample the delights of this city. It's truly an amazing place. Thank you very, very much. Uh, as the co-founder of Bright Foundation, uh, which is a public benefit organization, uh, they are involved in education, the empowering of people with disabilities, poverty alleviation, nature conservation, and the promotion of the arts and culture. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Franco. I want to say that again. Power and greed are two gods which, while powerful on their own, become almost irresistible when combined. Our continent is riddled with examples of these forces in action, resulting in the disregard for and abuse of people and the environment. The only counter to greed and power is love. Thank you.
Executive Director at the Africa Philanthropy Forum. We're a vibrant network of philanthropists and social investors who have an interest in inclusive and sustainable development in Africa. Competing with the, with the religious uh, organizations um, and also uh, with the government. Even the government is collecting funds for charity work. So it's, it's a very big uh, competition. There's a lot in the religious sector that is yet on top. And I think with greater collaboration uh, with the, the movers in the philanthropic world who understand how to create the right structure, you will do a lot uh, of help if you will leverage the heart that is already existing there. Find African social entrepreneurs or NGOs. And so we decided to just connect them instead of waiting on folks to say that you know, they couldn't find anyone. Half of that is looking at all these people talking about Africa and an Africans. My problem is look, I'm from Eritrea. I grew up in raised there. I was raised, I was born and raised in Eritrea. Uh, the Africans possess attributes uh, and, and skills, and they have access. Uh, to extensive transnational uh, social, political, and uh, cultural networks. And one of the elements in traditional African giving is the idea of sharing. So despite the problems we face in remittances, our money is sometimes not used the way we want it. We still keep doing it. It is also the, you know, the positive thing is it is engaging very problematic issues as well. I think that we shouldn't forget that there have been fueling conflicts on the continent and the government has been so only peculiar to the African It speaks to the need to integrate this continent and consider it as one country to build. I, I think I'm thinking of an Africa as one country to build. There are many places that philanthropy happens. In, uh, in banks that advise high net worth individuals how to spend their money. I decided that one of the things I wanted to look at was philanthropy outside the United States. And everyone thought I was crazy. But what it means is the conscious efforts that are made in ensuring that the approaches themselves, the type of Christians themselves that we have, speak to the various aspects of philanthropy. The mission of our school of business is to create future and responsible, meaningly, civically engaged business leaders and professionals. Here at the business school, we have a very, very broad view of what uh, an academic discipline should be about. I think uh, in Conservation Lab and even today, I mean, there's no question, there are so many common issues across Africa. We, everywhere that there are elephants, there are challenges. There are large animals, and we do have people living with them wherever they are. Recently, you knew, you uh, heard about the uh, destruction of Notre Dame Cathedral. And the response which um, the world gave to, uh, giving support to uh, restore it, I'm wondering what blessings we have. It is very truly a blessing to be in this time. There's other. Um, Africans who are also, you know, making sure that this continent grows, regardless of how other sections look at it as well. Some of our um, patrons or, or collectors believe when they buy work from an artist that they actually support the artist. They don't actually understand that they, you know, they're actually investing, they, they're getting but they believe. We have currently registered in our bibliography a scholarship well over 7,000 different uh, journal articles, books, and other publications done by scholars who have used the resources at the Archive Center. It's unusual for philosophy in South Africa or in Africa rather to have gone beyond one to two generations, and we're in our fourth generation of Former presidents can still contribute to their countries if, in fact, through their presidents, 
they lead honorably and distinguish themselves as leaders. Thank you very much. To that extent, many of the African countries are not having a consistent approach as to how to deal with their former heads of state. At best, some are forced to exile, and at worst, some are held into the Hague. In 1975, uh, most of the African countries was, were uh, independent during 15 years, but they didn't have a, a, a framework to discuss about ideas. Rwanda is one of the countries that uh, decided to approach some of us and say they've built a considerable history uh, and experience in dealing with official development aid, but they have no idea how to deal with philanthropy. Now the laws around the world is not contested, but you need an enabling legal environment and that philanthropy is very useful for any society. I am part of an organization called the Social Justice Initiative, which was created in 2013 to grow local philanthropy for social justice work. In the United Delta, there is an absence of sort of planning. Yes, yeah, this is the region that has the most plans on paper, stored somewhere, um, for the region for the development. You touch on a very important point, which is really around um, uh, uh, you know, putting in place legal frameworks that make it easy for us to, uh, uh, you know, move across uh, benefits from social protection, which are a reflection of the nature of uh, labor migration practices, right? You know, I talked about that practically. <laughs> <laughs> I talked about that. No, uh, sorry, doc, sorry, doctor. I've been telling myself, I'm about to learn like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, <laughs> because he interrupted the flow of wisdom. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that there is a beautiful book written in 2001 called Regulation as Emancipation that begins to question the notion that regulation in and of itself will create a culture, a psyche, a predisposition, and a power. Okay, so please join me in thanking uh, the panel uh, for keeping us awake. the communities that we're talking about when we talk about philanthropy for the benefit of communities who are the people and where are they and I think that for the first day of the conference having listened to the professors and the scholars and the activists the day would not be complete if we don't get to hear from the people themselves and we thought it would be a great opportunity for the trust to in fact invite some of its partners who work at the community level and have set up community philanthropy and again, it also speaks to how we think about uh, community philanthropy and who the community philanthropists are. Children's rights is actually one of South Africa's uh, focus areas uh, stated in the Human Rights Commission. And when we talk about uh, education as one of the rights, we just simply mean that it's the right to access the quality education for all without discrimination. And that is one of the um, SDG goals are number four. We talk about quality education. Yes, on paper, black and white, it's very real. However, flawed as it may be, there are so many kids out there who sit without uh, books, with limited resources, and at the end of the day, rendering them illiterate. South Africa was one of the 50 countries that took uh, part in a study. Uh, a reading study, and it pains me to say this evening that we ranked last. 25 million adults, their highest education here in South Africa is going to be Ladies and gentlemen, that is almost half of South Africa's population. And to be able to tell our own stories is one of the things that I heard today being spoken about throughout. It might not have been so directly, but there's a gentleman that I know, his name is Martin Meredith, he's from Britain, and he's written so much and contributed so much on the African literature. However, he is from Britain, he's written a bio on Mandela, on Mugabe, 
Um, but I often ask myself, from which perspective is he telling that history? Is it from the British perspective? I certainly would not want my history, my African rich history, to be told on any perspective apart from my South African perspective. This is like our primary school. It's a container school in the north of Johannesburg, on your way to Lanseria Airport. Uh, it services kids in the informal settlements. Some of these kids are abused kids. Some of them are kids who have suffered some form of abandonment. They're living with their, uh, with their aunts because of, of losing their parents to HIV and AIDS. Um, and we do, we do uh, book clubs with them, we do life orientation with them. We want to strengthen and expand our projects, such, such as our ECD project initiative, as a strategy to help South Africa and hope, hopefully eventually venture into the rest of Africa, uh, reaching its SDG goals by 2013. And we can ask what have you done to leave the continent. And Zikayezo, just from the boot of the car, like she says, um, facilitate a positive experience of the world for children one page at a time. My name is Raymond. I'm a chartered accountant by profession. I did an MBA at UCT and I spent a lot of time in corporate, working in investment banking, dealing with lots of spreadsheets. Uh, and then a time came where I felt I need to go fulfill my passion. I'm very passionate about young people. However, I've seen that young people in South Africa and probably around the world are treated like etols. I'm not sure how many of you have seen etols in this country, uh, driving around in Joburg. So etols was a solution that government, so a group of people met in a, at a conference similar to this, and they said, we need to come up with a solution We've built these amazing roads in Joburg, um, and we need to find a way to fund them. So, we want to give people etops, right? But the problem that happened is that no one was consulted. And I feel young people are treated exactly like this. We meet in conferences such as these, and we want to solve young people's problems, but there are no young people in the room. So, at Disky 99, we decided we want to let young people drive the solutions to the problems that they have. And a language that a lot of young people understand is sport, particularly soccer in South Africa. So four years ago, uh, a group of, of my friends, we started Disky 99, and we were operating in such conditions. Um, and we started an after-school program and a holiday school program. And these programs, um, We've made some, you know, we've affected 2,600 young kids who we are teaching life skills, we're keeping them off the streets, we're solving issues of crime, drugs, um, unplanned sort of like teenage pregnancies and sort of, uh, and, and those things. We've raised 780,000 rands running these programs. That has been grant funding. So we realized that grant funding is not a sustainable way for us to, um, to run these programs. So we started engaging and participating in the business of sport. So a lot of people watch sport as entertainment, but there's a big industry um, and it's a big business. So we take our young people that come through our holiday school program and our after school program, and we create opportunities for them at stadiums. So at this point in time, we are just solving the issue of rich people who buy these expensive tickets to sit in the VIP suites. And when they arrive at the stadium, they say, well, I don't know where to go. So we provide ushers for them. Um, they arrive at the VIP box, they meet our people, they welcome them. And through that simple solution, we've made a million rents in revenue. <laughs> So the mo we've made more money through this program than we have asking for grants. So this is our sustainability program. We've trained over 125 young people in customer service because to do this work, you need to be well versed in customer service, how to treat clients. And what we are seeing coming out of this program is that young people now are able to say, put in, in their CVs that this is the, they, they've got work. And this hospitality work applies across any industry. It's not even about sport anymore. Um, lastly, 
This young man here, I'm very proud of him. His name is Fezi Lechope. He's now 19 years old, and he's, uh, he's our success story. So when Fezile was 12, he was diagnosed with throat cancer, and he was in and out of school for two years. Um, and so obviously his education suffered, but Fezile was very passionate about sport and soccer, and he decided to be a referee. We worked with him, we groomed him, we mentored him, we made sure that his education doesn't stay behind, he can catch up. And now Fezile is South Africa's youngest professional soccer referee. What are the challenges that we have? We're a young organization, four years old, so we're looking for people who can partner with us because we're a growing organization. And sometimes we, we, we question ourselves. We don't really know, what, are we doing the right thing? Are we approaching this problem the right way? So we're looking for people who can partner with us whether it's resources, whether it's strategy, whether it's um, capacity building, we do lots of training, and of course, you know, your, your wallet would be, would be nice as well. I think that um, uh, you are absolutely right about the, the importance of telling these, uh, these stories, and this is why we felt the need to sacrifice just one hour from the reception to, to, to share the, the insights from, from our colleagues. And just to say that there's a lot more stories out there, there's a lot more stories uh, uh, beyond the South African borders. And to be able to use the power of, uh, of uh, film, the power of art, the power of poetry, music, whatever, you, you know, whatever form, to tell stories from the community perspectives without being intercepted is really important. And we hope that uh, that's an angle that we can bring um, to uh, the centre, Becky, I'm looking at you, um, <laughs> and making those, uh, those connections and partnerships. Thank you. Uh, let's give our panellists a round of applause. It all began on the 16th of May at the Vets Business School. Good morning, everybody. Fellow champions, I'm so glad to be here this morning. A couple of years back, we were approached by uh, Higher Life Foundation. So this is the culmination of uh, two year collaboration. The eight panels graced by various philanthropy actors had interesting insights on the space. It, it has to be something that will yield a legacy. <laughs> That's why I think the way I think. But what's difficult about this is that the power is there. And that philanthropy sits easily within the business school. There were major impediments to you partnering with or funding African-based organizations. I know you don't want to be comments, but I think I, I must uh, give a comment to say this panel was just like really fascinating. <laughs> Now, if you get the validation, the way you access the validation is very different when you invest in collaboration. It was a conference to remember and the beginning of new ventures in the philanthropy space. 